A short time after blockchain technology was introduced, cryptocurrency evolved from an obscure hobby to a financial inevitability. What's next? Welcome to Unlocks, the convergence of traditional and decentralized finance. Unlocks is a partnership formed between Skybridge, Algorand and Nax, new asset exchange to create a carbon negative digital asset creation platform that enables the transformation of traditional assets at scale. Launching four future of finance marketplaces, the first two leverage the scale of one of the world's leading manufacturers to introduce a first of its kind buy now pay later platform that utilizes Algorand's DeFi capabilities to mint loan NFTs. Additionally, within the warranty marketplace, Unlocks will launch an exchange that tokenizes excess risk flowing through the manufacturer's captive insurance company. Unlocks is also working with the world's largest insurer of fine art to create a platform that will securitize assets for lending, fractionalization, and trading. The fourth initiative is a digital asset exchange and commerce engine that leverages Algorand to create fungibility across crypto, loyalty points, rewards, and cash to help consumers maximize purchasing power, wealth visibility, and the value of their digital assets. By implementing the Unlocks capabilities across multiple markets, business leaders and everyday consumers will realize the benefit of the future of finance. Unlocks, we are building for where markets are going, not where they've been. Thank you everybody for joining us. I'm gonna I'm gonna get right into it. Uh, I think I I'll introduce the panelists, although they don't need an introduction, but it's I think it's worth it. Uh, Jeff Schumacher, who's the uh, the founder of the NAX, uh, was also at Foundry 55 and the BCG Group, among many other things that he's done in his life. But in addition to that, he's just been a great friend and a partner of mine for almost a decade now. Jeff and I go back. Uh, where we've worked on many different projects together, and so I'm very proud to be chairman of a part of NAX known as Unlocks, which we'll get into in a second. Scott Gunter is the chief executive officer of AXA XL, uh, the property and casualty and specialty risk division of AXA, insists on AXA's management committee, and Jan Uchen, that I do with the name, not bad. <laughs> excellent, not bad. excellent. Almost, the American ever. almost a Stuttgart <laughs> accent from me, right? Uh, is Managing Director of United Internet Media uh, and is CEO of One and One, and One Mail and Media Applications. And he's also responsible for all the portal businesses conducted by One and One Group. But I think the real reason why we're all up here today is that we each came to Algorand separately, although perhaps Jeff may have introduced these two gentlemen to Algorand. Uh, I got to Algorand through one of my old business colleagues, uh, my old boss, I sold my business a few years back uh, to a gentleman by the name of Bob Matza, who made a very large investment in Algorand. And then coincidentally, Jeff and I were working together on the new asset exchange. We were having breakfast, I think, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I said, hey, have you ever heard of Algorand? He said, well, you're not going to believe this. I just flew back from Boston, where me and my team are doing an extensive amount of work on Algorand. So I think this is all very fortuitous. But I think that the the most important thing about what we're going to get into is that these are the largest projects, not just for Algorand, but I think as you start to hear this discussion, these are the largest pro projects in the world of cryptocurrency and the blockchain. So, so with that, I'm going to go to Jeff first. Just uh, high level, uh, tell us what you're working on, Jeff, and tell us how important these yeah. two individuals are to the NAX. That's a good and question. What is the NAX, by the way? <laughs> Probably should explain that. So the NAX, which stands for New Asset Exchange, is we're an incredibly confidential firm. We've got a website there largely for our team to get visas to get into the US. So uh, it's not there to tell you what we're doing. Uh, we're going to be coming out a lot more vocal now and more communicative of what we're doing uh, in the coming months. So it'll be more, uh, uh, more available to the, to the audience here. Uh, but what we, what we do is um, we're a digital mint. Uh, so, and how we work is we look at how money flows through corporate ecosystems. We identify assets. We take those assets, 
we put it through our platform, we transform them, and we bring them out in form of DeFi projects. Uh, and we have a series of those that are coming out. Um, we have one in, in, art, in art lending and art securitization. We have another one that's uh, very novel in buy now, pay later. Another one around uh, consumer warranties uh, that'll be quite significant. And then uh, one of our biggest will be around uh, digitizing loyalty in the exchange. Uh, and so those are the big things that are coming from us. But the way that we think about it is, uh, you know, in 1608, the Dutch Indy Company created stocks. Um, and the entire financial infrastructure arose from that. Um, what we're able to do now is create these new markets. We don't chase markets, we make them. So we create these new markets, um, and they're in the DeFi space that doesn't require all that financial infrastructure. Now, we're not skating regulations or doing any of those things. We're embracing them, but we can, the speed to which we can put things into the market, I, I think, hasn't been seen before. And with the Algorand protocol, which is fit for purpose around decentralized finance, it fits perfectly into our platform, and hence why we did a lot of it. Let, let, let's go right there for a second, then I'll get to, to other gentlemen. But why Algorand, and what brought you to Algorand? You had these ideas before you identified Algorand as the platform to build all this stuff off of, so why? Well, so, I mean, we've been in the space, um, Nax was incubated in my previous platform, so we've been around this since 2014, so about seven years now. We've experimented with other protocols that have um, similar properties, but they don't have the, 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 the volume aspects that Algorand can handle. They don't have, um, the, the proof of stake, which gives you that carbon footprint that we talk about is, is important to us because ESG is a major function of what we're capable of doing uh, in EF, ESG platforms. Uh, the security that it brings is really important as you will start to see uh, some of these platforms and how important security is. Uh, and then the, the, the more broadly, the scalability. Um, and then having met Silvio and having met Steve and the team there, they're very aligned to the financial innovation that we're trying to create. And we're not, Anthony, again, we're not trying to take just some corporate asset that's already there and moving it uh, to the blockchain. Uh, I think a lot of corporates are experimenting doing that, and I think that's largely a waste of time. There's no real need for that. Uh, we're taking that asset and we're transforming it and we're bringing it to the, to the, envir uh, to the DeFi uh, environment at scale. Um, and that, you know, a lot of people in this room are got some really great ideas, but they're lacking the scale. Um, and the scale is the game changer here. And you'll see by just the, the tens to twenties to fifties of millions of wallets that we can create in some of these platforms, it's quite significant. And just the volume that, that we're gonna be able to enable uh, and unlock. Okay, let me, let me go to Scott now. So Scott, you are part of one of the largest insurers of fine art in the world, AXA XL. Uh, what are you working on with the NAX right now? And it's a, uh, you know, when Jeff and I started talking, we met a couple of years ago, and we, we started talking, and one of the, you know, we insure a tremendous amount of, of fine art business, and we hear from our clients quite often, they say, hey, that's great, but what other services can you bring us? And one that shows up a lot is, is be able to extract the money out of the art, right? So when you, you pay, you pay multi-millions of dollars for a particular art work, it's on your wall. That is trapped money. And a lot of people who collect turn around and say, boy, it would be fantastic if I could extract that much, some, of, some of the value out of that and perhaps buy more art or a different type of artist or expand into different types of art. And you know, right now, today, Anthony, when we look at that, the world, it's, it's a very chopped up manual process to do that. There's a, there's a couple little spots that do it, but it's, it's not easy, right? And, and it's also, um, and extracting the value out of that art and, and lending against that isn't really a developed market. And our clients are going, we just want to buy more art. Is there a way we can help extract that value? So this is a securitization process. You take the art, appraise it, and then you're trying to figure out a way to create some liquidity around it. And you're using the NAX to supply that off of the backbone of Algorand. Is that yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly it. As, you know, we're the insurer of the art, and we work with Nax and Elgrand, what, what that role, what their role is, is to turn and say, look, we can find financial instruments to help execute this, right? And the, really, the, the, 
the issue for us or the opportunity for us is scale. Can you scale this to the level where it's like, wow, these clients can actually get this done relatively painlessly and then be in the, be in the marketplace looking to e extract that capital out of that artwork. And it's, you know, it's, it, we just, it's super exciting for us to be able to provide that service to that customer. So I just want to step back. You're, you're one of the largest insurers in the world. Uh, using Algorand, of all the cryptocurrencies that are out there, you're using Algorand and the NAX to provide this service. So tell, tell us why. Tell us a little bit about the thought process and the underwriting and due diligence that you guys did at AXA X, XL oh, yeah, to come we, to that decision. Yeah, we did a, and Jeff would, <laughs> Jeff would know this, we spend a lot of time uh, very carefully working through our discussions with NAX and then subsequently Algorand, just to, just to understand exactly how it's going to work, right? And uh, it was not a, a short term, it was over a year of careful due diligence on that process, just to make sure that we all understand the mission that we're on here, and because our clients are really important to us, right, you, very important to us. Caused some pain for Jeff Schumacher, just so you know, I could. Yes, you can see it in his face, yes, it was a yes. A year of due yeah. diligence and torture, but after that. After that, yes. Being a good corporate citizen, you made the decision, Algorand and Nax, and when is this product going to launch? Very soon. Uh, you know, we're into the, right now we're working towards the sort of the proof of concept phase, which is really an important part, uh, and working through our distribution to figure out, okay, is this, is this exactly what you need to tweak it? Make sure it, it satisfies what the clients are looking for. But uh, we've been working on it. We sort of started working on it before we, we finalized the deal, which is exciting. Yeah, I think, Anthony, um, just to, to give the audience the sheer volume, the, it's right. five billion in, in underwriting. And if you simplify that to underwrite art, there's about 25 attributes you capture. A subset of those 25, 12 attributes are required to lend. So now we have this massive data set and volume and understanding that you can then create the lending platform and then Nax's ability to securitize loans and then bring other investors in to recycle that capital gives us this perpetual way to build something at scale. So I don't, I don't want to oversimplify it, I may not even state it properly, but from a traditional Wall Street perspective, you're going to be fractionalizing the art and then securitizing it and then selling it in bundles to high net worth individuals, institutions. Take us through the process, Jeff. Well, you, you start out with, in, to, to Scott's point, you, you, you have high net worth that buy art, but a piece of art comes up in auction, you don't have a lot of time to go find that capital, and not everybody is total liquid at that time, so this gives you an option to do that. At the same time, you can go into art galleries right now. You can walk out of here and go to the Ferrari dealership and buy a Ferrari, right, and get car financing, but you can't walk into an art gallery and get art financing. You will be able to now. And then at the same time, you can take it even further. If you take COVID, which we're all dealing with, um, you have the, the museums that have been crushed by COVID, right, and they run on very thin working capital lines. Well, now we can come in and be able to provide working capital. And as that grows, you can get further and into- can use their fine art as security. You yes. go to somebody like AXA for the insurance and then securitize the work. bundle yes. and create the security over the Algorand network. Yes. Exactly. And exactly. then you can go further to get into the fractionalization and the and so I, 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 you know, I like repeating myself. So I want you to go back to the magnitude of the volume that we're talking about. What's the scale? It's, well, just with, with AXA alone, it's over five billion that, that you're looking at. So it's, I mean, that is significant. That's the largest in the world by a factor of a thousand. So it's, it's quite big. And All being done on, on the Algorand network. Correct, it's designed to go on that D5 platform. And so let's go to Jan for a second. Your company, One and One, is the largest application provider in Europe. Tell us a little bit about your company and tell us your approach to this as well. What will you be using Algorand for and how does it uh, work alongside of the next? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we're running uh, Europe's largest B2C communication platform, predominantly on an email platform, with over 43 million active users. So um, half of Central Europe is accessing our platform on a monthly basis, and having all their B2C data stored in our database, which we aggregate for them. And on top of that, of course, um, you know, that carries the identity of the user with, on, with it on our platform. So if you tag those assets, you look at the problem that we have great technology, as Amify, as, as Algorand, um, it is looking for a distribution, how to connect those right pieces of technology with the mass market out there, because we need these real-life use cases, right, at scale. Um, and we said, okay, 
this is a perfect platform to leverage this because we're, our core business is aggregating data, right? Aggregating B2C data, transactional data, it all sits in our database that with AI we can leverage and can make useful for the user and of course for the commercial markets. At the same time, the users have endless money locked into loyalty accounts, virtual assets that they can't really aggregate because it's all stuck in silos, right? So that technology um, that, that Nax is working on together with Algorand, um, it allows you to aggregate all your virtual assets in one wallet. So if you combine that, I would call it de-siloed kind of virtual asset uh, pocket, combine it with our aggregation of, of transactional data, so that's, uh, I think, a massive opportunity to really bridge this gap of distribution because at the end of the day, distribution is all about reason and occasion, right? So you need a reason and you need occasion to do something. So the best occasion is you receive an email, say you purchase this pair of shoes, so okay, you're entitled for 100 loyalty points, but you never can use them because you don't know where it's stuck in which pocket. So if you just click on it and say, okay, transfer this to my MFI pocket, or to my MFI wallet, well, then we unleash this, um, or unlock this, this, this hidden value in there. Uh, and the reason is quite obvious, so saving money, and if that isn't enough reason, we have our loyalty program ourselves on our platform that we already have implemented, so we have a kind of virtual currency on our platform with a couple million users, so we can use that on top to accelerate that process of really bringing mass use cases into the great new world of crypto. So, so let me make it concrete and you, you respond to this. I've got frequent flyer miles with American, maybe I have loyalty points from Best Buy or different places like that. Uh, I'm able to then liquefy them. There'll be a token created. It'll be an Algorand-based token. Uh, and I'll be able to then convert those loyalty points into that token and then use that token to buy something perhaps that I want to buy, which isn't related to those lo loyalty points. Exactly. So, so you're tokenizing. you're unlocking, which is a great name for the, the, the company. He's the king of names, by the way. You're, <laughs> you're unlocking the value that's trapped in these things for people. Uh, and you're going to use Algorand because of the scalability related. Yes, yeah, a brilliant summary. The operability, the security, the scalability, transaction speeds, carbon negative, all those reasons you're going to be using. A absolutely, absolutely. Thing. Exactly as you said, tokenizing this industry, will they make it fungible? So you can really transfer assets from one class to the other. And if you build a bridge, to kind of the traditional user databases, I think that gives you exactly the, the point to ignite this whole process because that's what's lacking, right? Now you can aggregate those assets, but you don't can reach out to the mass markets at the moment. So I think if you can get to big platforms at large scale, um, you know that's exactly going to make the difference uh, to a lot so, of other. So programs. young, let's talk about the scale for a second. Uh, how many millions of users do you think would? be attracted to that? Or how many millions of users do you currently have? And then once this is tokenized, how many millions of users do you think will be attracted to it? Yeah, so well, you can measure users in different currencies, right? So the most hardest currency probably is the monthly active users. So there's over 43 million. If we go for 90 days in the finance industry, they sometimes go to 90 days, and we have 65 million. And we have a very high activity rate on a daily basis. So I said have almost half of Europe is on my platform on a daily basis, right? So this is the scale we have. On the database is, of course, very rich because everything you do you, on the web, or you, any transaction generates emails. So it leaves a fingerprint in, in our database with what you have. And of course, that's, that's a massive database with over 100 billion emails to be analyzed with our AI. You can subtract that data. Even on frequent uh, traveler programs, you can see who signed up for those programs. You can say, do you want to transfer these miles? Because most of the people out there, they don't even know that this technology exists, right? So in this community, everybody knows what, um, uh, how to do that and, and how to unlock your hidden values, probably. But uh, in the mass market, it's still unknown. So what you need is mass market technology and platforms to really bring this great technology. But I mean, I think the, the starting point is 43 million users is sort of the beginning point, and then you'll be able to attract potentially tens of millions of more, if not 100 million. Absolutely, absolutely. And plus, we have an ecosystem with a lot of commerce firms already on it. So basically, that those transactions already take place on our platform. So 10% out of all e-commerce transactions are generated from our platform directly. And then you know, every transaction passes our platform at some point in the in the process chain, right? So um, it's very easy to use existing loyalty programs to digitize it, to tokenize it, but also you can stick in new loyalty programs to incentivize people for doing things on your platform, doing new deals, switching a retailer or whatever right, you makes, want to do. Makes great sense. So Jeffrey, let me ask you this. 
43 million users there. You're also working on a warranty program with some of the largest consumer brands in the United States. You're working on a buy now, pay later program, yep. also based on Algorand. 43 million users there. We just talked about a $5 billion art facility, uh, getting started with AXA XL. Tell us about the additional wallets. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're basically bundling three projects into one. Um, if you think about it, we got a consumer finance play, we, we have a warranty play, and then we have a tokenization of loyalty. Those are kind of a bundle that you can bring. Uh, and uh, a lot of this is white label. Like, many of the end consumers are not going to know that this is a blockchain related solution, right? They're just going to have this app that. Right, they're uh, going to go to XYZ company, they're going to buy yeah. their consumer electronics or their yeah, apparel and, or and furnishings. It, it, if you just take the, the, the loyalty platform that's coming out with, with United Internet and one on one here, um, we did another one on our previous platform. It's called BACT, B A K K T, that came out. Um, that just spacked. Um, for north of a billion in value, and it had at the time it's backed 500,000 customer downloads. Those aren't customers; those are just downloads. We're talking about 42 million customers backed partnerships that it signed, like three or four loyalty partnerships. They have thousands. So the scale, like people don't understand the scale. So you're talking 40 plus million potential wallets, and a customer may never see the wallet. Like on their email exchange, you'll, you, you, we all have our email apps, right? It'll say mail, it'll say contacts, it'll say calendar, and then it'll say exchange. And when you tap on it, it'll just basically pull in all of your loyalty points and give you an asset value, and allow you then to convert it to cash, convert it to other to to cryptos, whatever you want to do. That, that is the scale that we're talking about. So it's 40 plus million that you have access to. The buy now, pay later platform we're having has 30 plus million that you have access to. The warranty side will create immediately, just on the claims we know we'll get, 12 million wallets. So the size of these platforms that we're putting out are significant. And then if you look at the art and the volume that we're creating here, this is where it's exciting, where you're bringing the DeFi space into you know, scale. Right? That's the hardest thing. There's, there's lots of projects out here. You guys should come talk to us because we also have capital and a fund um, that we're doing together. Uh, the, the, the thing you lack is scale. And, and, and that's the hardest thing. You know, I've, you know, our previous platform, I founded 200 companies. Right? Um, one in third worked. One in three worked. Um, and if you looked at the main reason why they didn't work was scale. <laughs> we couldn't get scale. There was too much capital required to buy your customers. Well, we're starting with them. So you look at back, you go to their 8K on their filing, they're going to lose $150 million this Our year. Customer acquisition. Buying customers. Right. So that's the point. So, so, I mean, I just, again, just want to summarize for everybody listening, 43 million plus the buy now, pay later, consumer warranty space. We're talking about another 30 or so million. And so as this gets executed over the next 12 to 18 months, the Algo wallet pickup is about 70 plus million. Probably. Is that fair to say? To that. I mean, th that's the point of the scale. And, and it's n and not so much about how many Algo wallets, it's about what that protocol brings. I mean, it, there has, it hasn't broken. It, it, it has, you know, you, you, it has interoperabilities that we need to move within these different platforms that we're dealing with. So, Scott, I want to I go back to AXA for a second. Uh, you, you've spent your entire career in insurance right. at, the, at the top levels of the insurance industries, and we know how careful the underwriting process is for insurers. And so just, you mentioned it was a year, but I want to drill down a little bit. Tell us what you went through to make this decision to use Algorand and Nax. Give us a couple of specific examples of what you were concerned about, what your team was concerned about, and how the Algorand protocol and Nax's services as a asset exchange uh, met the test for AXA. Yeah, I, uh, you know, we, as I mentioned, we spend a lot of time with the with the Nax team before Algorand, you know, before the involvement of Algorand, just to just to sort of get an understanding of of some of the key protocols. And for us, for example, give one example is we're really concerned about obviously about client information, very concerned about you know privacy for customers. Right, and that's a that's a that's a huge issue in any any uh, sort of situation that we're looking at. And we spend a lot of time with the with Jeff and his team just to get comfortable that when we when we work through this, we're going to cover those key 
key privacy issues, right? Because you're talking, besides just what you should be doing, it's also, uh, you know, you're dealing with a lot of customers who, who aren't, you know, they want to make sure that their information is protected. And I think that's absolutely critical to these kind of projects. It's like, okay, I don't want my information out there. I don't want to get hacked or anything like that. I want this to know that I've been involved in this. My information is going to be secure. So we spent a, a that's a good example of a lot, a lot of time on that topic, just to make sure we're all on the same page and how that's got to get built. And that's just one. We had, you know, we go through it. We're, we're an insurance company. We underwrite, right? So we work our way through each of the steps. And that would, for us, that's a, that's a big one for us to, uh, and we'll make sure it's done correctly. Absolutely. So, so Jeff, I want you to react to this because uh, in our partnership together, uh, one of the things that I'm always amazed by with you is your vision for the future. And you said something that I want the audience to pick up on. You said, you know, oftentimes people in a core, core corporation, a large scale corporation, they want to move to the blockchain, but they're doing similar things now and they're trying to just interpolate that onto the blockchain. Whereas what you're doing is you're reinventing processes. Uh, an example would be the, the financing piece for fine art, but there's so many other different applications. Ultimately, your vision for the NACs is what? Well, if, if you think about it, the, the video showed you um, a, a, view, a view of that, right? So the, the NACs is capable of bringing significant volume. Algorand brings the protocol Skybridge brings the institutional involvement, which keeps it moving and, 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 and sticky. If, if you think about the, the digital mint and what we're doing, we're, we're, we're transforming data, right? And data is the most valuable commodity in the world. It's more valuable than oil. Um, but if you and I figured out oil was the most valuable commodity and nobody knew it, what would you do? You'd go buy all the land that sits on top of oil. Well, what we do is we sign half-decade contracts to mine corporate assets, to find assets that we can transform through our platform and, and then put it in a DeFi space. So that's, that's the game. And what we've built at Nax is a, a securities and trading platform to do that, enabled by our technology and powered by our development. And there we think we can, it's, you know, you've heard about digitization and all of these jargon words. There, there's this next step here of moving to these DeFi, but it's not taking what exists and to stick it in DeFi. That doesn't create any value, right? You have to take something at scale, transform it, and bring it to DeFi. Then you have value. And I think that's the problem that's been existing is most of corporations have been trying to deal with blockchain-related initiatives, but they're taking something that exists as there. Same time, many people in this room have game-changing ideas, they just don't have the volume. So we take that, transform it, put it out, these game-changing DeFi ideas, and we've got five of them coming. We got another one in art, or in, uh, uh, with Spin Magazine around NFTs, that's our fun one uh, that's coming out uh, that I think uh, Jimmy, the CEO of Spin, is talking about later. So that's the play, is taking something that exists, transform it, bring it out at scale, and enable these game-changing ideas. Okay, I don't, I don't want to turn this into Shark Tank, but I sort of want to turn it into Shark Tank. <laughs> I want you to pitch Jan. Okay, give us the pitch. You pick up the phone, you call Jan. You say, okay, this is what I want to do for you. And this is what the NACs can provide alongside of algorithms. Okay, go ahead. Let us in on the call. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Jan, how are you? Okay, give us the pitch. <laughs> in Deutsch or in English? No, no, no. <laughs> Let's do it in English for the sake of me. Okay. Forget about these other people in the room. So, United Internet and one and one mail and media is the, one of the largest portals in Europe. And you sit, and if you look at what that business is and you get away from email provider and all those other things, you're in essence a data aggregator and the data that you sit on. Um, and if we look at 42 million customers and that data, there's lots of value. So we would come in and the pitch would be, we think we can unlock more value out of that. And one of the things that you would see is your users have loyalty points, air miles, and just as similar as Scott was saying in, in the art, that the, the value's locked in that art, we have a way to unlock it. And that value that they have that's locked up in loyalty points that are not very fungible, we can make them fungible. And now for um, United Internet, instead of thinking yourselves as an email portal, what if you were an exchange? And if you thought about yourself as an exchange, and, and then you would say to your user base, 
I have a way to create value for you. And all of those millennials and others that are using email all of a sudden will see their asset value, and a lot of them are what I would say are asset rich, cash poor. They have lots of air miles, they have lots of loyalty points, but they don't have a lot of liquidity. Now all of a sudden you can take you know, Johnny user A and say, look at Johnny, you have this many air miles, this much loyalty points, here's your total asset value. And all of a sudden they're worth 7,500 euro. And now we can convert that and create value and there's value that you otherwise couldn't create for your, for your customer base and this is an entirely new um, uh, 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 value stream for you and it actually converts a data aggregation company into a financial services company and you benefit from the multiple of that. Sorry, so I'm, my next I'm, line is to I'm say how much you want sharks, for 10 of your business. <laughs> I see right? Silvio's in for 100 grand, I can just tell <laughs> by looking at him, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna match Silvio. How did he do, Jan? How did he do? Is that compelling to you? Yeah, it was, it's just my, my line would be how much do you want for 10% of your business, right? So, yeah. so. yeah, and but, but Jan, some of the ancillary benefits of what Jeff is saying is not just for you, but it's all of those clients, right? It's the airline companies, it's the apparel companies, the furniture companies. They all of a sudden now have opened up this uh, opportunistic window for all of their customers. So they now have a fungible asset for doing business with those people, which will likely expand the relationship. Is that exactly so? All this market is missing is a platform in the middle that can aggregate, you know, all these ideas and make them fungible. So make the assets fungible and somehow connect them to a user base where all the commercial data already sits, right? So, and from then the ideas are endless, right? So the you know, most obvious one is, uh, you know, going after these virtual assets. Mm -hmm. um, second one, of course, launching virtual loyalty programs. I mean, there's nothing more natural than making that, that crypto because it's virtual anyway, right? So it's the first virtual fancy currency that you have for years, for decades out there. So, um, you know, you never touch your air miles or something, right? So this is virtual already. And uh, so is isn't something, anything you can think of that is, that is easier to bring to the mass market than something that has been virtual for, for, all, uh, for the entire uh, for your entire life. And um, so, you know, all the pieces we have them together here, I think, even on this stage. Um, and we just need to make sure that we connect the dots uh, and, and pull the plugs. Yeah, and, you, and you can think like when you're, when, you're, when you're taking a corporate asset and you're trying to use it, it's almost like a carve out, like a private equity transaction. You're trying to buy the business. Although I'm not trying to buy the business from Jan, I'm trying to just use it in a different way. So they have their core value proposition that generates their enterprise value. Now I can put this on the side and increase their enterprise value, but I can also do it strategically. So the most valuable customer you have is a paying subscriber, right, versus a free user. So they have a lot of paying subscribers, but you can see this, this exchange in order to get to the tokens that we're creating, these, these algorithm-based tokens. Um, uh, uh, in, the, in the wallet, you have to flip to a paying subscriber. So now all of a sudden I create this side business, but I also can drive the core strategic business. Right, so you're raising revenue as well. So it's a, it's exactly. a win win for both. And, and if you take it and you take it over to the art side, you've got a $5 billion data asset of art sitting in the middle that gives you all of this data that necessary allows you to do things. But as you create this platform that's coming out, um, if just like in cars, if you finance cars, you buy more cars. If you finance art, you buy more art. If you buy more art, you underwrite more art. Right, it's better for the art market, it's more volume, it's more and appreciation. Underwriting is their core business. Right. So now I've just built a massive channel partner for Axum. Right. They're, they're so, so Scott, let me ask you this. As you think about this, and you've had three decades plus of experience in your industry, what other applications, in addition, is there, oh, let me ask it this way, are there any other applications in addition to art that you could see this applying to in your industry? Yeah, you can, you know, just the, sort of the, Anthony, the easy ones are, are sort of the adjacencies, right? So you take, you take art and then you move it into, for example, jewelry, right? You can move it into wine, right? Any collectibles that people collect that traps capital, right? So that's just on the sort of the personal side. You can also look at it on the business side. Jeff so this would so include memorabilia as well, It right? could be memorabilia, Comics, anything, anything that you sort of, it, cards. You, you buy, you keep it. I say, I love it, I want to keep it, but boy, that ties up a lot of my capital, keeping that, whatever it is, right? Baseball or, and can I, can I use that money in a better way, right? And again, the market, it's, 
there's, you can kind of do that today, but it is incredibly fragmented, very, very difficult to do, highly paper intensive, right? And some you just can't do. Some you just can't get, uh, sort of take a loan or, or other, other money against it. So and then you start there and you start looking for other illiquid assets that you can move into, whether that's businesses, you start looking at the businesses. Jeff mentioned that even you go to the art, art museums, museums tend to be asset rich cash poor. Right, so what else can they do with those assets to help them with their cash? Right, that's the big issue with a lot of museums. Right, and you can help them actually by you know get new instead of having to sell to stay alive, you can actually find a new way to help them either have new exhibits, new things without selling what they have. And Look, that's they pretty could, cool. I mean, let me take it one step further. They could have a priceless piece of art and leverage it to buy more art, right. and all of a sudden they've created a greater appreciation in their draw. portfolio, yeah. and then they're able to lend off it and create income and so forth. So it's almost like the, the I mean, I don't want to say it this way, but I'm gonna, they, they, the, the museum can almost become like an art holding company or you know an art hedge fund or private equity fund as a result of this tokenization. Yeah, we, under, like, we underwrite a lot of museums. They only really show an art recap. They only show 10 to 15% of what they own. Most of their value is in the basement, stored someplace, right? I get a lot of trap money there. And maybe there's something else we can do with. And, and they say, boy, if we, could have, if we could have more, we could expand our facility, maybe get a different exhibit and get more people coming, generate more cash. So it, there's a lot of upside to unlocking that asset. For so so when, I, when I listen to the three of you guys talk, what comes to mind for me is you've got this great technical asset, this cryptocurrency known as Algorand, and there's tens, maybe five to 8,000 cryptocurrencies, but you've decided you're gonna build these things on Algorand, and it strikes me that this is a breakthrough moment for Algorand, because you're now going from a great community of Algorand, to a larger institutional community where you're now bringing tens of millions of wallets. So my question to you, Jeff, as we, we wrap up here, where do you see this in five years for the Algorand community, for the NACs, for insurance companies, for loyalty programs? Where are we? And let's say we're in 2022 already. It's 2027. Uh, how many wallets do you think we'll have for Algorand? How many, how many things do you think we'll be working on? Well, I, I look at it, we'll, by then we'll have about 40 institutions participating with us. Each of them have significant assets. We'll have, we already have a funnel of about 10 more projects that are coming. Uh, so you imagine, you know, with the relationship like AXA, you're going to do two ventures, uh, projects a year, so that's you know, 10 projects there, so it's 400 projects, and they're all of scale. So, and then they start, they start uh, interop, or uh, the ecosystem starts participating together. So there's things that AXA and United Internet can do together, and they were already talking about it last night. And then, and then we have another theme, which we haven't talked a lot about, which is ESG. That's our number one theme. As you know, you and I sit on the board of the World Economic Forum. I sit on the Infrastructure Committee, the Emerging Tech Committee. I had the argument with Klaus that the Paris Accords are not going to be met. Why? There's not enough instruments to invest in that drive. Right. You don't the, have the economic incentive. Yeah. And you look at what AXA and Thomas Verbal is out forefront saying, hey, they're pivoting the entire organization around ESG-related initiatives. Um, even United Internet has a potential to remove a hell of a lot of carbon around digitizing mail. Um, and so the assets that we can create in, in, in the ESG space are significant where you have an NGO that may have done the investment in this uh, uh, carbon platform. They're the experience. They're, they're setting goals, but you can create tokens and incentives on Algorand's platform that actually create profitability for people to achieve those goals. Basically. An ability to take them out of their investment, give them a return, allow them to do it again so we can recycle the ESG capital. That's the important point. Now you get scale. Even in art lending, if you can't recycle the capital, if you can't securitize the loans, you get stuck. You have a limit of how much money is coming in. That's part of the securitization of that. You've heard of you know, mortgage-backed securities. Now you'll have art-backed securities. And through the institutional side, you create the market making that will actually buy those assets, right? right? No, exactly. And then you can wash the capital and recycle. 
But we're, we're leaving out one more piece, and I know we've got about two minutes. You're leaving out the consumer piece of this, where you're also working with well-known consumer brands to bring loyalty, servicing to them, buy now, pay later, off of the Algorand platform, and what other services are you working on with some of the largest uh, globally recognized yeah, I mean, we're, we're doing a buy now, pay later, and everybody's heard about that. They saw Afterpay get bought by Square for $29 billion, right? Well, we're building, again, most of our stuff is white labels, so you'll never know it. Like, the end consumer won't know that they're using DeFi, and frankly, they don't care. Um, they just care that you're solving a real business need. So our buy now, pay later bolts into the, 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 the company that has the customers, and we can see the CLV calcs. So we can see how valuable they are. So now all of a sudden we can offer something different. And then at the same time, we can package up those loans, create a security, sell them off. On the other side, you have the warranty. You buy something of value, you want a warranty of that. So we know effectively we're going to have 12 million wallets over the coming months here that are going to go on to Algorand just on the warranty side, which is pretty much their entire ecosystem, right? So uh, that's really valuable. Now you have the warranty on the other side, the piece of whatever you're buying, the, the electronic or whatever, and you can arbitrage both of those, and those become very valuable. So from a consumer point of view, you're getting a lot more privacy, and, 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 and uh, you're getting something that you otherwise wouldn't be offered uh, through these DeFi uh, platforms such as Algorand. Okay, well, we're right on time, so that wraps it up. I just want to thank you guys for being out here with me today. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to hearing about the problem.